Hey everybody, this is Chris from CSS Tricks with video screencast number 99. Uh, it occurred to me in the not so distant past, I did a whole bunch of research on HTML5 forms. Uh, it's a really interesting new topic. I work at Wufu. We deal exclusively in web forms, and we are working on trying to move our system into using HTML5 forms and whatever uh, capacity we could. So I set out about learning about HTML5 forms, what the kind of the current state is, and we ended up publishing a resource on Wufu. So it's at wufu.com slash HTML5. Uh, that's a whole kind of area of the site called the current state of HTML5 forms. Now, I guess when we say the word HTML5 forms, what are we kind of talking about? I'm kind of thinking about it as four things. Uh, three of them are here. Uh, there, there's new types, there's new attributes, and there's new elements, and there's also new um, JavaScript stuff that goes along with these things that we weren't able to do before HTML5. So uh, I've given this as a talk before a couple of times. So I have some information kind of tucked away in a keynote file that um, uh, maybe we'll reference a little bit. I've never done this before. In all the screencasts I've done with you guys, I've never used keynote before. Uh, the vast majority of features are progressive enhancements. So in this talk, this is where I wanted to start out is when we, I want to think about HTML5 forms in this context of, um, there's browser support issues with this stuff. And we're going to get into that a little bit, but that can be a quagmire and it could be like a 24 hour podcast. It would be a little ridiculous. I want to think of these features as progressive enhancement in the, and that in browsers that support some of this stuff, uh, great. Let's use it. Awesome. In the browsers that don't, most of this stuff falls back to a point that it's not a big deal. <clears throat> or that we can supplement it with something else. Anyway, so we're, we're thinking of every, every one of, of HTML5 forms features as like a good thing. This is like an improvement for forms. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, not a big deal. So let's, what do I have in here? Uh, yeah, we're going to work from that assumption that everything that's a part of HTML5 form is an improvement of what we have now. Like there's not stuff in HTML5 forms that are like, you gross, right? Uh, and that's, there's, you know, there's, what does that mean that it's an improvement or what, what is it better? It means that we're able to be more semantic with our forms. That means like better describe the thing that it is. So if we're trying to collect an email address, it's an input of type email. So it describes what we're collecting rather than the past where we would just be input type of text. It's just better that way. Uh, it's more intuitive for users. So there's, there's things like uh, we can use uh, the, the placeholder attribute to put a little hint for a thing in there to a field in there that uh, possibly would suggest what we're asking from the user. So the user doesn't have to think as much. It's not as frustrating what we're trying to ask the user. We can uh, provide, you know, there's, there's UI mechanisms to make forms more intuitive. And then it's just faster and easier for users to fill out. For example, asking for a date. If we have a really fast date picker that comes up, that's very obvious what people want. They click the date they want. It's there. Uh, it's done. Uh, you know, it, there's parts of HTML5 forms that deal with uh, validation, really fast client-side validation. So there's some speed stuff going on here. There's fe features in HTML5 forms that make forms literally faster and easier to fill out. Oh, I made this analogy about a Smurf village and how each of the features were kind of like one of the Smurfs in the village, but you really had to be there and it required on an, an earlier joke. It was really stupid. And I'd rather rather not have that flop again in real life. Now, it's important to know that all of these features require your page being HTML5. You can't use you can't use the placeholder attribute on a on a form uh, <laughs> and have the doc type not be HTML5. You have to start there. It has to be in the HTML5 doc type. HTML5 is not case sensitive, so you can go crazy case with your doc type if you want to. Now, this is, this is why I wanted to show these slides, I think, for the most part, is that back in 2005, so this is six years old, but, you know, whatever, uh, Google did this study where they looked at uh, over a billion websites and figured out what the most common class names on elements were, and that's what this chart is. So the most popular class name to use on an element ever is the footer. 
is the class name footer. And that's this was some of the research that was looked at when HTML5 was deciding what elements they were going to create. So footer, obviously, is one of the new elements in HTML5. Now, you'll see a few other things in here. Um, like date, for example, and search. I'm not sure if this is the exact research they used to start thinking about that, but some of this stuff, some of this idea, this, you know, what are the popular things that people are trying to collect with forms made its way into that thinking. So yeah, uh, you'll see header, footer, and nav there. Those made it into elements, but you'll see things like search and date there. So let's think about input types a little bit. That's one of the things that makes up HTML5 forms. We have literally new types. So this is what we had before in HTML4 or whatever, uh, XHTML2. Uh, we had input type of text and we use that for all kinds of stuff. What's your first name? What's your last name? What's your social security number? What's uh, anything that's like a word or a sentence was probably collected with input type of text. All kinds of different stuff. Email, URLs, telephone numbers, numbers of any kind. Uh, see all those things right there? Now those are new types. So literally... Uh, we can be more semantic and, 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 and tell an input exactly what kind of information that input is going to collect. Now, there's other benefits to this as well, which we'll get into. So that's where I say, oh, we have this new thing on Mufu and stuff. That's this page that you're looking at. Yay. Now, this, you know, the landing page for this resource is... Uh, tells you what each one of those new types is, which each one of those new attributes is, what the new elements are, and then a bunch of kind of useful code snippets that relate to all this stuff. Now this is a chart, and you'll see lots of green check marks and red X's and yellow squiggly marks and question marks and all this stuff. That's a lot of data that you're looking at. Blah, what is all of that? <clears throat> it's browser compatibility stuff. So a green check mark obviously means it is a, a supported feature in that browser in that particular version. X means it is not supported. And the squiggly means eh, it's kind of supported in some kind of way and that there's uh, information specifically about what does that mean kind of supported. I didn't want to just say kind of supported and leave it up to you to figure out. So that's a lot of data. If you're interested in a particular feature of HTML5 form and want to know what the kind of the lay of the land is and the support for that particular feature, just roll over that row and you can kind of see these are the popular browsers in the world right now, what the support level is for that stuff. Uh, or if you're just interested in a browser, how is that particular browser? You know, that's what a chart is for. It does chart-like stuff. Now, this data came from, I have this big example HTML5 form here that has each one of those new features. And then it does um, some background scripting test stuff in the back to figure out if that feature um, is required, it, it works or not. So if you want to just literally look in your browser at a real-world HTML5 form and see what works and what doesn't, uh, you can come to this form. So most of that data on that chart came from there. Okay, now more than just this resource, literally every single one of these types, attributes, and elements I have a unique page for with information just about that feature. So that's what I was hoping to do in the screencast is hopefully kind of scoot through each one of those pretty quickly. To get to those, just click on the question mark here or just anywhere in here. We're going to start with the type of email, so that one of the new input types of email. It looks like this in HTML5. It's one of those things. Remember, in the past, we'd have to use input type text. Now we're using type of email. Yes, it is more semantic, but it, it has some, there's a, it does more than just be semantic. Literally, just by virtue of having type email on here, if I type that into this field, which is type of email, and try and submit it, I'm in Chrome here. Chrome will put up an error message that says, please enter an email address. It knows what I've entered is not an email address and validates the form for me. I had to do nothing. I had to add no extra CSS to this page, no extra JavaScript to test for the develop. For the validity of that field, it just works, just by virtue of having type email on there. Pretty cool, huh? So that's type email. There's a number of these. There is um, type equals telephone number. It doesn't do any validation. If you think about phone numbers, it could be, you know, 1-800-1. 
your mom or whatever, or it could be just a, you know, six or, or a seven digit thing with a dash, or you could leave out the dash, or it could be periods, or it could be international with a plus sign and all that stuff. There's too much weird stuff going on with telephone numbers that validation doesn't matter. I can type ABC here and it will submit that form and uh, this page submits to itself and whatever. But it does do a couple of other things. Like if you're on the using mobile Safari, for example, and you click into a field in mobile Safari that has type tell, you'll get this. Not just the num not just the number version of the keypad, but literally at just a keypad. Uh, so that's faster to fill out. I know I would be very happy when when I or I am happy when I'm using mobile forms and click into a field that wants a telephone number for me. If it gives me this keyboard, that's awesome. If you don't use type tell, it won't give you that keyboard. <clears throat> All right. Type URL. If I type ABC in here, it knows that is not a URL. But if I type HTTP CSSTricks.com, that is a URL, and that will work just fine. If I type A colon, questionably, is that a URL? I'm not sure that it is. It will take that as well. Uh, so just, you know... Be aware that some kind of weird stuff can slip through from time to time, but in general, it does a pretty good job at knowing what is a URL and what isn't a URL. Now, this stuff works. It's not just Chrome that this works in. I can Let's grab this URL and open up Firefox. I think I have Firefox 4 here. Maybe it's 5. I'm not sure. <clears throat> and look at how it handles things. So it's not just Chrome that this works in, you know. Uh, uh, Opera... Has, it probably has the best support of all of the browsers on as far as its uh, validation levels. Come on, Firefox. I'm trying to do a screencast here, buddy. Oh, it's way over here. Hi, Firefox. No. Oh, that's the search bar. It's super big. Shows how often I use Firefox anymore. ABC, submit query. Now, it looks different. It's this kind of, actually, I like that a little better. It's like this dark gray gradient kind of thing that says, please enter you, but it works here too. Go Firefox. Let's keep that open in case we want it again. Let's open Opera and look at what Opera does. I'm going to invent a new theory that your computer never works as slowly as when you're trying to submit a screencast. Here is Opera. ABC, submit. Oh, so Opera does a weird thing there. See, this is where we're at in HTML5 forms. Weird stuff, man. <clears throat> if I type ABC, it knows that's not valid, and I click out of it. Look at that, it just on blur. And click out of it, it just, it just makes it a URL for me, although it doesn't put a uh, extension on it for me. Well, that's weird. Anyway, that's how Opera's handling it, so just be aware of the cross-browser quirks. Um, let's keep moving. Move along, move along. Input type of date. Okay, so this is what Chrome is doing, is it's giving us, the, these are called spinners. See, if I click up and down, it will change the day. I can also use the scroll wheel on my mouse to move up and down. So it's doing something for us here. Uh, it's not super useful, but hey, it's something, you know, put today's date in there automatically for us. That's kind of cool. If we jump over to Opera, let's, let's see, it's the next one, right? Uh, what it does is it makes it kind of a drop-down menu. Oh, that's enormous because I set the font size really big. So the drop, it's kind of a drop-down, but it gives you literally a built-in date picker. I didn't have to build this myself. I just pad an input with type of date, and it does this for you. So uh, date can do some cool stuff that way. Uh, I'll tell you right now, it can, you know, if we edited this up here, you can give it a minimum and a maximum, and, and um, it will gray out dates for you and stuff like that. It's not just type of date, but there's type of date time, which include a time too. There's localized versions of it. You can select months at a time, weeks at a time, or just a time picker. Uh, pretty cool. And Opera is leading the way with that. No other browser has that picker thing yet. Okay. So input type of search. Now even the spec says there's not much you have to do with input type of search. Um, uh, really, it's just a semantic thing. Like if it's a search box, just use type search, and then theoretically, like screen reader type applications will be able to announce to their users that that's what that field is for. Um, I don't know, theoretically without labeling it, I guess. 
Uh, WebKit has taken it upon themselves. Actually, I think all the browsers are doing this now. They put rounded corners on it. Um, and then if you use the non-spec, but uh, this works, uh, results equals five, you'll get the, uh, the, the little uh, magnifying glass here. And it has a little arrow, even though the arrow doesn't work. It only works if you use um, autosave some unique value, and that's just like put the URL of your website or something that somebody else isn't going to use. Let's open Safari. <clears throat> so in the browser Chrome for Safari, that's what um, the search bar looks like. So isn't that kind of nice to know that the users are already used to using this to search for things and your search forms basically look just like that um, elsewhere in OS X, in the Finder. Um, search looks like that. So it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's preying upon, uh, not preying upon, but it's just using user established, you know, interface patterns kind of stuff. So it makes sense that just applying type equals search to a field makes it into kind of a search field. Actually, let's go to that page in Safari. Come on, Safari, search. And I type apples. And then I type bananas in the drop down menu with autosave on it it will have oh it just has bananas that's weird come on apples now they're both there it didn't save the first one i would call that a bug i'd have to do more testing but still why didn't it save my first one super weird right I'll tell you, cross-browser support on this stuff is weird now i'm not going through every single detail of all this stuff but on these pages, as you read through them, if you're interested in this stuff, I, I have little like little interesting bits of problems and stuff to know and uh, CSS snippets that are relate to these things and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, use case scenarios for literally every single one of this stuff. So if you're interested in HTML5 forms, deeply, truly, look through all these things, check out the browser support and read the, the lowdown. Okay, back to Chrome. We're just going to keep a home base in Chrome. Next, the color type. So if you're trying to collect a color from somebody, probably not everyday kind of development work, but uh, kind of interesting. Turns out uh, Chrome or Opera 11 supports this one. So let's go to one of the ways you can quickly jump to different ones here is just come back to this chart, click on color. Now we're on the color one. Opera 11 has a color picker, yay, and they have standard colors you might want to pick, or if you pick other, it will open the um, the native picker. Now, this is the Mac one. I'm not actually sure what it does on PC. Maybe I wrote it down here. No, I didn't, but I, there is a in super interesting factoid here. The browser on Blackberries, which I did not test for in my charts, sorry, I just didn't have a Blackberry to use. The Blackberry browser supports this on, on Blackberries, the input type of color. Super weird. You think of anywhere in the world that they want to like save space and not complicate things too much. It would be a mobile browser like that, but whatever. It works. Okay. I know, you know, I think Chrome has a pretty cool picker coming up too. I think I saw Paul Irish post a post on how that's going to work. I bet everyone will have a color picker eventually. At least one that opens the native um, OS environments color picker. That just seems to make sense to me. Oh, we've spent too much time on color. It's so unimportant. Input type of number. Now, that's practical. I mean, you have to collect numbers all the time for different stuff. Here in Chrome, you get the spinner. So you click up and down. It just goes up by one. It goes to negative numbers. You can use your mouse wheel on it. If you put something in here that isn't a number, it shoo. So that's a new thing. Gosh. Or I forget all this stuff. So you type ABC and click out of it, it will just delete your data. Gosh, I'm not sure I like that. And then I think if you type a really big number, it'll like comma separate it for you. That's weird. Okay, so this is an important one to do. And this actually happened to us at Wufu. We use type equals number for our credit card number fields. You'd think a credit card number is a number, right? But it was freaking people out because it would put commas in there for them. They're like, what the heck? Don't do that to my credit card number. And I submitted a bug report and it said, they said, well, it's not really a number, it's like a code, so just don't use it for that. Uh, but we actually figured out there's a few, there's like some specific numbers you can put into this that when you do that, um, it screws up the rounding and changes the last number to a zero. It was really weird. So this is a little buggy too, but 
What are you going to do? So if we tried this in... Let's try it in Firefox. Welcome back, Firefox. We type ABC in here. Oh, that will take it too. You're a weird, Firefox. Yeah, I put an X. So I should look at my own research, I guess. Doesn't work. What does work, though? Hmm. I guess that's it. And Opera says it kind of works. I wonder what's up with that. Oh, well, allow any color, any character. I guess that's what kind of supported means in this case is that it probably provides spinners or something. But if you type like banana in there, it will take it too. And like technically JavaScript wise, it will like accept that attribute as an existing attribute. Um, but it doesn't, you know, work properly. That's that's the kind of thing that would that would. Um, put a kind of supported mark on something like that. So, okay, type is number, very useful. Later on, we'll talk about um, some attributes that go very well with type equals number. Type equals range, it turns the input into a slider thing. So we're outside of the realm now of little boxes that you type in. Um, if, if you give an input type of range, it makes it like this. Now, if you, with CSS, set the height higher than the width, it should make a vertical slider that's obviously broken here in Chrome. Uh, I think Opera fixes that. Let's try Opera. Yeah, Opera has vertical ranges. So there you go. Opera's kicking butt again. Weird stuff, isn't it? What supports what? Um, kind of interesting. You can't by default see what number I've selected. So I think by default here it's 1 through 100. I think that's the default. So if I'm way up here it's like 80, 85 or something. That's what it's going to submit. The, spe the spec specifically says it's for inputs where the, the specific number submitted doesn't really matter. Um, that it's kind of irrelevant, like opacity or something. Like, how opacity do you want this? You don't care. If somebody's using the slider input, they just slide it to the level they like, and they let go, and that's fine. That's what it's for, not like, how many biscuits do you want to buy? That's probably not a good use case for range. Oh, range, range. Oh, we're done. So now that we're in purple land here, we're out of types and we're into placeholders. Placeholder, I think, is one of my favorite um, things ever. It puts the, see how it says Smurf Ed in there? If I click into there, it's going to disappear. And if I click out, it goes away. Now, unfortunately, I have some CSS on here. Let's go to JS Fiddle. I put some CSS on that page for some stupid reason that made it red on purpose, but I'm not sure. If we just go input placeholder equals, hi guys, type equals text, and run that, we'll see the result over here. See, naturally it's this light gray color. Uh, which kind of makes sense. Like, that's not the real value. If I type my name in here, it's that nice kind of bold black. But if there's nothing in there, it goes to that gray, like, reminder text or whatever. Uh, it's not a replacement for labels, so theoretically stuff should still have a label. Like, this should be, you know, this should have a name of, like, name or something. And this should be for name, name. <laughs> You should still do this. They should still have a label pair. And even if you, you know, if if you wanted to hide this or whatever, you could get rid of label by like absolutely positioning it off the page or whatever, and then replace the placeholder with name. I just want to say, don't use placeholder in replace of name. Um, this is how I would do that. Position, position, absolute. Wow. Something like that, and then I would go class equals hide. So, oops. That's if you really want to do in field labels, I would at least do it that way so there still exists a label. Uh, and you're just using placeholder here or just write JavaScript to do it or whatever. I'm just saying it's not a replacement for label. That's my whole point there. You can use CSS to style it. That's proof of it. Now, in certain browsers, it works on inputs but not text areas. 
so in this case it works in both but as you can see in Safari 5 it worked on inputs but not on text area so that was a little wacky wacky and that's how it works there's plenty of JavaScript ways that you can replicate this behavior people have been doing it forever so um, but it just makes it a lot easier now and it's one of those things that makes a form possibly faster to fill out so in this top example here let's say we're trying to collect a phone number from somebody you would have a label that said phone number but we want to make sure that they give us the area code too so we'll use a placeholder as a hint and we'll say this is the format that we want it in Guaranteed we're going to get more entries that are the format that we want uh, than we'll get, you know, otherwise. That's the point, guys. The next attribute, autofocus. So you see when this page loaded, it was right here, and I can type. Immediately that field was in focus right away. Totally cool. Now there's a cool example of like Google. Uh, like if you go to google.com, it's like that. I can just start typing immediately. Look at them do results. That's pretty cool. There's like some study somewhere, somewhere. Look at, I wish, I wish I had links for you guys, but it like just that feature alone makes Google like a billion dollars a year or something like that. The fact that just you know that people are you know can search that much quicker and use that much less thought, and that they like Google more even if they don't realize why. It's because of that little feature. So autofocus is pretty cool. This is one of the ones that we wanted to use at Wufu. We thought, hey, why don't we just autofocus the first field? That'd be neat. Why not? It'll help people fill it out faster. We couldn't do it because people embed Wufu forms on their site, and it could be like below the fold, for example. And even if it's in an iframe, which Wufu forms are, it will like scroll down the page to wherever that field is. So if you put your form lower, it would scroll the page. That was kind of annoying. So had to skip autofocus at least for embedded forms. Oh, the max length attribute. Max length is literally how many characters. So if I'm in an input here, I'll be like, hi, I'm on vacay. Oh, I can't keep typing because max length totally cuts me off, dude. Why are you cutting me off? I can't keep typing. It just cuts off. So that's one of the ways a browser can accommodate the max length feature is just cut it off. And uh, other browsers handle it differently. I think Opera covers it differently. If we go to the same thing, I can just keep typing forever in Opera and then hit submit and it will say, ooh, that's crazy big. Oh, it lets you submit it, but it gives you an error for a second. Uh, it's trying to tell me, even though it should actually prevent me from submitting that form, it's crazy that it doesn't. It was trying to tell me that I was over too far and it was gonna let me edit it, but for some reason it lets you submit the form anyway. Yeah, it gives you this message. The enter, the, the enter text is too large. You use 40 levers and the limit is 10. I prefer that because it allows you to, let's say this text area was, please include your 150 word bio or something like that. So you'd paste your bio in there and it would be too long. And I'd be like, oh, dang, it's too long. I'll test it. Oh, it's still too long. Well, let me remove this word here. Let me remove this word here. Oh, now it's long enough. Hit submit and you're good to go. I prefer that to the trying to paste your bio in and having it just cut off. You're like, oh, crap. I was going to edit that, dude. Anyway, that's max length. Works on inputs and text areas, although it has a little bit of the quirk. On it work, doesn't work on one or the other. Uh, that's, I guess, a problem in Firefox 6. 3.6. Firefox 3.6. Min, max, and step are really useful. Remember I said that they work on... Um, Dates, I think that's really cool. It will gray out dates like before and after a certain date if you do it right. Usually they're used on numbers. So let's say minimum, maximum of 100 here. I can use my scroll bar and it won't let me go past 100. won't let me go lower than zero, even if I click these buttons here. So that's pretty cool. It also has a step. You'd see, so if I just go up one, and the arrow keys work here too. If I just go up and down on the arrow keys, it goes up by fives because that's what step is all about. It doesn't just help me out incrementing by five, but if I put the four in here, it won't take that. It's not valid. Now look at where it put that value. It's so weird. I would call that a bug. Anyway, crazy. I mean, it's nice that it, it validated it for me, but why does it put it way over there? Maybe it has something to do with the font size. It's a little unusual to have a crazy font size that big. Nope, it's still placed weird. 
whatever. Still kind of cool. I think those are, are, are pretty good um, things, especially how it works with your mouse. I like that. Min, max, and step. This is a really cool one too. It's called data list. Now data list is technically a new element because you can see this code here. That's a new element. That's not, that's, you know, it's a new element. And it has an ID. And in this case, it has an ID of planet data, which matches uh, the new attribute here on the input as an attribute of list equals so that those IDs match. The list attribute matches the ID attribute of the data list. So here it is, Earth, Venus, Mars, whatever. If I type Earth, Earth, doesn't work in Chrome. Eh. Works in Firefox though, let's check out Firefox. I wanna show it to you guys, I don't wanna just explain it. What it does is it, it's kinda like a drop down menu, but it's still a text input. So E, it will show me all the things that have an E in it. So Earth and Venus have E's in them. Now if you just do nothing, it will show you the whole list if you want. If you click into it, you have to click twice I guess. Click once in there, click again and it will give you it. That's weird. Weird, weird, I bet the spec doesn't even cover that. And if you select it, it will put that value in there. Or you can type in whatever you want. There's no validation implied for it. Uh, it's just a helper. So a good use case for this is like current, like popular searches. So if you use uh, Google Site Search, this is really cool. They like, if you use Google Site Search on your site, they'll provide you um, like a, X, a URL of an XML file that's all the most popular searches on your site. It's pretty easy to, to process that server side and turn it into a data list and just throw that on your search field. And there you go. It will help people find their, their most popular searches quicker. -er. Data list. Love it. Uh, Autocomplete off. So... Um, some browsers have an autocomplete feature that just is part of their browser abilities. And this is, you would say, don't do that. It's just a way to say, don't do that. Like, um, let's say a forum was asking for your pet's name and it said pet's name and auto, your browser's autocomplete was like, name, I know what that is. I'm going to pre-fill it with Chris. But my name, my dog's name is Digby. So be wrong. The chances of your browser knowing your pet's name is probably super low. So on the design side, the person building that form would probably put autocomplete equals off on that. Or you put it on a password field or anything that's like secure that you for sure you want someone to type it in themselves. They should use autocomplete off on that field. The accept attribute is specifically for the file input and it says it deals with MIME type. So in this case, images only if I click this to open it up and go to my desktop, there's nothing on it. Let me make a graphic quick. I'll just take a screenshot. Now it's gonna allow me to select that because it knows a PNG is a file like that. But if I go into TextMate and create a file and just type some text and hit save and put it on my desktop, untitled.txt. That's grayed out because it's not an image file. It tells me right down here. It's only accepting images. So that's what accept is, and it has various support. Some, some support, like it only works on PC, like on Firefox, but it's kind of cool. I mean, if you're going to, if you have a specific scenario where you only allow people to upload music files or text files or image files or whatever, why not use this attribute? You know, the fallback is it just doesn't work, but when it does work, it makes your form easier to fill out. Makes that dialog box easier to use. If you want to allow multiple files on a file, just put the attribute multiple on it. It will allow me to select both of these now. Whereas otherwise it would only allow me to select one of them. Now you have to process that on the server side, but still useful, cool. The required attribute. Now remember way back when we started this thing, we had type equals email, right? And it, we typed ABC and hit enter and it wouldn't allow us to put it in there. But what it would allow is just if we just didn't put anything at all. It doesn't validate nothing. So if we wanted to, to validate an email and you have to enter something, you'd have to use type equals email and the required attribute. So this one is required. If I hit submit, it's, only, it's gonna say, please fill this out, dude, you didn't put anything there. And, if, and this one's required too, and it's in the same form. So if I hit submit, it's going to be like, dude, you've got to fill out this one too. It highlights an interesting part of HTML5 forms in that 
Uh, when it does its validation stuff, it just finds the first problem on the form and validates that for you and puts the bubble in there. And then it'll find the next problem or whatever. If you want to write your own JavaScript that utilizes some of this stuff, you can kind of do it all at once yourself. But if you want to use this kind of built-in natural stuff, that's just how this works. So required is super useful. Everybody who needs required fields on forms. Uh, and, the, and all you have to do now is put required on it. Totally awesome. Uh, pattern. Now, if you're a developer, if you're a developer, you probably not haven't made it this far into the screencast because you're probably like, oh my God, this is so boring. But if you're a developer, you probably know a little bit of something about regular expressions. Uh, these are HTML5 takes JavaScript style regular expressions uh, in that format, and you just pass it as the pattern attribute, and then this field will validate to that regular expression. So if I type this in here, it's going to be like, please match the requested format. The requested format being this in this case, which means one letter or one number between 0 and 9 and three uppercase letters. That's what the three is. So it will take that. So that's that. Bring your own validation if you want. If you're not happy with how URLs are validated, you write your own regex and do it yourself if you want to. Now, there's a bunch of different attributes that are built to go on the form element itself, like when you open up the form, not on the inputs, but on the form itself. One of them is no validate. So this particular form has an input of type of number in there with a step of five. So if I put four in there, uh, without no validate, this should block it. It should say that's an invalid value. But even though this should fail validation, because I have no validate on the form element, it's going to go through. So it's a way to force no validate, but still use some of these features. We actually use this at Wufu because uh, we want to use some of the stuff like type equals email or whatever, but we have our own way of validating forms and we don't. We want to use type equals email, but not have the browser do its validation. We want to do validation our own way. That's what that's for. So <clears throat> form no validate doesn't go on the form element. It goes on the submit button itself. So for example, we have a form here and we have two different buttons at the bottom of it. One is to submit the form, which this is required, so it's not letting me fill it out. But if I hit save, it's not going to validate the form. It has this form no validate thing on it, so it will go through. So it's a way to stop validation at the button level. Pretty neat. Okay, more button level specific attributes, the form action. Let's say the form action is to go to example.com. I can override that at the button and say, please go to wufu.com instead, and it will override it and it will take us there instead. So if you have multiple buttons at the bottom that want to go to different locations, that's how you could do it. You could override the default. To change the value from post to get, you know, I don't know, I don't have a super good um, scenario as to why sometimes I write use cases down here I was just checking for one uh, I don't have one for that but if you need to override that for some reason you can do that at the button level you can open a new window instead of instead of having the form submit to its own page this will open a new window that works in Chrome so that's pretty cool a lot of these I'm like I don't know why you'd want to do that but it's like if you're gonna allow overrides you might as well just write them all so instead of a particular encoding type you can override the encoding type you might as well have the power right uh, spell check this is another one that's like would be good for Google right you don't want to be bugging people about their spelling right on Google you want them to do the search and show them their the possible spelling fix after they've done the search right uh, or it's just somewhere where you think people are going to put weird words and you just don't like a, like a username or something. They're going to put a weird word there. It's not going to be spelled right. You might as well turn spell check off so it doesn't bother them. All right. Greenland. We are in the new elements. There's only a couple of these, so bear with me. Uh, the meter element, literally, you see these things down here? Uh, we give it a minimum, a maximum, what the current value of that meter is, and it shows us literally a graphical meter. Now, there's no CSS specifically to style these like this on this page. It's just what you get. It's a default Chrome version of what a meter looks like. Uh, and, and, you know, if the value is, is um, what you can give it is not just minimum, maximum of value, but you can give it, how, what are the attributes for that? Let's inspect it. It's like low and high or something. Yeah, uh, minimum high. 
So if it's lower than the minimum value, which must be going on here, then it makes it yellow. So it's like warning, your meter is too low or whatever. And now if, you, if you're maxed out or exactly at the optimum, it's just green. So the only two options are green or yellow, but it's kind of neat. Meters are specifically for when you have a defined minimum and maximum. And then there's another one called progress, which is very similar. This is the default for progress, but it doesn't have a minimum. The minimum for a progress is always zero. So it's like uh, for a file upload or whatever. You can't, there's no minimum of five or something like that. A file upload is always 0% uploaded and 100% uploaded. And you tell it what, what point along that progress that you are. So little bit different semantically and they are styled a little bit differently too now there's the output element uh you know pretty much all browsers supported i didn't even put browser support here because it's just it's just a tag it's just like any other tag a browser can't not support this it's just an inline element but it's semantically for the result of a form so if you put four and five here that should work i don't know apparently on form input doesn't work in chrome anymore Maybe it works in Firefox. You know, the point is, this is the world's simplest little form, right? Does nothing support on form input anymore? I should have just put an input button. I attached it to a, a, a an event that should work, but apparently it doesn't. Whatever. I hate you guys. Ha! I don't hate you. I hate me for doing such a stupid thing. It should put nine here because I have on the form element... I have on the output element, I have on form input. And because it's part of the form, it should respect the on form input thing and add these two numbers together and put a nine right here. And all, the whole point of all of that was just to say, if there's output from a form on your page and you're displaying it on that form, the semantically correct thing to use is the output element. It is the output of the calculation of a form. That's what that's all about. It's just kind of a semantic level element. Key gen, we shouldn't even talk about it at all. I'm totally not qualified to talk about it. It's for basically, I think it's like if you don't have HTTPS but still want to submit a form in a secure way, it can do does some crazy stuff on the client side and submits a key. And really, it's more, it's, it's more complicated than that. And I don't know much about it. I know that it's like never used because security isn't one of those things that you can just allow a couple of browsers to do it. But if you're in a browser that doesn't support it, well, then that one just isn't secure. It's just not cool. And IE has said, we will not support this. We will never support this. We are against this. <clears throat> so you can't just have a browser that's secure in everything except IE. It's just one of those things that you can't have any cross-browser parity on or whatever. So don't even worry about it. All right, that's everything. That's everything that is HTML5 forms. We made it through every single type, element, and attribute. I think we did a pretty darn good job there. Now, in my talk, generally, I talk about a few, like, example, real-world case kind of things that would show you. Let's just do a few of them because this is super long anyway. If you've lasted this long, you might as well. Let's, let's talk a little real-world stuff. And remember, to make a form better, it's more semantic. Our code is better. It's more intuitive. It's less frustrating for the user. And it's faster for the person to fill out. So we use the HTML5 form features. We get real benefits from doing that type of thing. Now, this was me trying to fill. I was having a problem with my Verizon Fios internet. And I was trying to fill out this form. And I was like, how could this form be better with HTML5? Well, see all these asterisks on these fields? That means it's required. So let's use the required attribute. Um, the autocomplete should be off for my Twitter name because then there's no way my browser knows uh, what my social media profile name is. And if that were to accidentally prefill, it would be wrong. So let's just turn, make sure that that never happens on the form level by turning autocomplete off on that field. It wants, there's six different individual fields for my phone number. And I was filling this out on my mobile device because <clears throat> my internet was down. So I needed a device that had internet to work. So I had to fill out six little fields, all with telephone numbers in them. They should have type equals tell on them so that it's very easy and quick for me to figure those out. It's asking for my email address. That should be type equals email. 
It asks me what the issue is. So I think it should use the placeholder attribute to put some stuff in that field that, that is like kind of explains what they want to hear, what's most useful for them uh, to be there. You know, give me some tips. What do you want to hear here? Uh, an autocomplete off, definitely on the captcha down there because the captcha is unique every single time. I was filling up my taxes here. Uh, you can see it I was asking me for my EIN number there, and it has a very specific number that it wanted to get from me that was in the format nn nnn or whatever. Let's say I didn't know that, and I wanted to um, come back later to that. And so I wanted to put a note to myself in there. This is Ask Diane. Now, that's an example of where... I would want to not validate that field just for now. So if I had a save button at the bottom of this as, as opposed to submit, I could save it with that incorrect value in there by using the form no validate attribute on the button. And when I and then on that input itself, I could use the pattern attribute to mimic the exact pattern that I wanted to get there. On forest.com, like a social code sharing kind of feedback site, this entire field here is it's it's asking you for unique information. So I don't want anything to pre-fill. Let's turn autocomplete off for the entire form because it's asking me to fill this out myself with unique data. It's asking me for a URL. We should put type equals URL on that field. And then that drop down menu here. Now theirs is customized and really cool looking, but it basically is mimicking the functionality of a data list. So if you didn't have as cool of a system as they have there, you could just use data list instead. Uh, Dribble. Here's the page where you upload a new f um, thing on Dribble. Up in the upper right, there's a search field. Now, that's um, of course, it should have a type of search, but it's always cool to have a data list there in case there's popular search terms that people search for, like I don't know, header, footer, sidebar stuff that like people are looking for inspiration on. Uh, the meter attribute would be great for how many um, dribbles you have free there. And then the only thing you can upload on Dribble is an image. So that input should have an accept. Uh, attribute of image so that when you're going to select a file, you don't accidentally select something that isn't an image. Twitter has search. It should have autofocus because that's the main point of sharing is on Twitter. That would be pretty cool. Uh, Google has the autofocus. It has a max length because you can only do perform searches that are so long. Spell check should be off. Facebook has search. It has date fields that are opportunities to use the date picker. It's using probably placeholder up in that event section up there to um, so that when you click into that, what are you planning? It goes away and you can type in other stuff. Date possibly date fields on Hipmunk or you know maybe you know what they do such cool like JavaScripty stuff on Hipmunk to uh, allow for that like. Um, you know, you can type in tomorrow and it figures out what tomorrow means and puts it on that thing. This is in a case where you probably wouldn't use it. You're doing such cool stuff anyway. You probably wouldn't use HTML5 date picker there because it's it's too restrictive, you know. And then uh, here's the checkout form on Big Cartel. Possibly, you know, you let's say you wanted to sell things only in increments of five. You could use minimum so that people can't like order negative one of something. And then if you want to sell only a dozen at a time of something, you put a step equals 12 on something for certain formats, stuff like that. Uh, here's an example of a credit card number kind of area on, on eBay. Don't use the number attribute for credit card numbers, remember, because that can cause problems. Uh, but if a credit card number field is a good example where you could use a pattern because you know exactly what the format of a credit card number is going to look like. And a max length of three for the three-digit thing on the card identification number there. So lots of stuff, lots of stuff. Now, sometimes I talk about uh, at the end here kind of what we were able to do at Wufu. And it's, it's an interesting scenario because Wufu has like so many users that we had to kind of limit what we were able to do and provide. And then, you know, there's certain things that Wufu does, like our own date picker is kind of nicer and it works in all browsers. So we're not using type equals date on date dropdowns. We're using our own thing because it's just kind of better right now. But we'd be prepared to use it in the future. Uh, once cross-browser support is better, or if we can progressively enhance in a, a better way. So that's HTML5 forms. I know that was a lot of stuff, but I couldn't believe that I hadn't talked about it yet on a CSS trick screencast. So hopefully you're kind of up to speed on HTML5 forms, and we will talk to you guys next time.